Good day on this 31st of January, 2022. This is the first uh, of a series of PCR webinars on TAVI. Um, and today uh, I am happy to be joined uh, by an actual heart team, we can say. Um, we have uh, myself, uh, Nicolo Piazza. I'm an interventional cardiologist uh, from the McGill University Health Center in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Uh, we have a cardiac surgeon or a cardiac interventionalist, we should say, uh, Professor Sabine Bleisifer, welcome uh, from Bad Oeynhausen, Germany. And we have an imaging specialist, uh, as we all know, Jerome Bax from Leiden uh, University Medical Center. So welcome you both. Hello. So today's uh, uh, PCNR, PCR webinar is how should the heart teams adapt to the recently updated Vavier heart disease guidelines and we have two major objectives. The first is to discuss how the heart team or how the heart team has been modified recently by the updated valvular heart disease guidelines to treat patients with severe aortic stenosis. And secondly, to showcase some procedural requirements and objectives of a transfemoral TAVR in a low risk patient. So Sabine, um, we have uh, 60 minutes uh, for, uh, for this discussion now. Uh, why don't you start with the case presentation? Hello to everybody. It's a great pleasure to um, contribute to this first webinar in this year. And um, I would like to introduce you a patient we recently treated. Um, she is a 75 years old lady she had um, dyspnea and retrosternal pain during walking, relief after pausing. Her risk factors included hypercholesterolemia, family history, and um, from a, a risk calculation, she was a low-risk patient with a Euroscore 2 of 2.19%. She then had uh, diagnostics. Her coronary angiogram uh, showed a uh, one-vessel disease with a... Um, stenosis at the left anterior descending and um, normal right coronary artery. She had an um, echo demonstrating a severe aortic stenosis with a mean gradient of 42 millimeters, a tricuspid valve, severely calcified um, aortic valve area 0 0.7, um, some MR, and a good left ventricular function. And to complete the diagnostics, she also received a CT demonstrating a small anatomy with a um, with an annular size around 22, um, a tricuspid valve again, and um, potential good candidate for transfemoral TAVI. So I would uh, like to hand over to Nico to to discuss what are the factors. Uh, we should take into account for, yeah, thanks. for our dis yeah. Thanks, Sabine. Yes, thank you. So, uh, Jerome, I, I think this is a very interesting case on multiple levels. Um, you know, we have the new ESC EX guidelines uh, that were recently published. Um, you know, there's this um, whole discussion about age versus risk stratification. Can you tell us a little bit more on how the guidelines have incorporated these concepts into the algorithms? Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, that's a very good point. So it's all structured now around uh, the age and the age cutoff that's being put forward is 75 years of age. And so if we look at these guidelines, what we see there is that that is crucial in the middle. And then also we take a look at the risk. So basically you can phrase it as follows. Patients at uh, an age less than 75 years at a low risk for surgical aortic valve replacements. And that is, uh, let's say, a score less than 4%. Or if they're unsuitable for TAVI, these ones are referred for surgical aortic valve replacements. They should be, of course, suitable for um, a surgical procedure. And then the patients that are equal or more than 75 years of age or unsuitable or high risk for surgical procedure, and that is a score more than 8%. And they should be suitable for TAVI. These are the ones that we consider for transfemoral TAVI. So it's all based on age 
and the risk score. These are the two things that are really in the center of that. Then you got other factors that are influencing your treatment modality, and that's very patient oriented. So we got previous surgery, bypass grafts that you can damage that favors TAVI, severe frailty favors TAVI, or let's say something like suspected endocarditis that favors surgery. So that is basically the fundament of the guidelines, how you appoint your patients. Thank you, Jerome. Uh, Sabine, if we can go to the next slide. So I, I think, uh, Jerome, what you were trying to highlight is what's in the blue boxes, um, where they stratify age uh, and risk. So less than 75 and an STS less than 4% and unsuitable for transfemoral TAVI, we go for SAVR. On the opposite end, patients greater than 75 or unsuitable and high risk for SAVR with an SDS score greater than 8% and suitable for a transfemoral TAVI, we go for TAVI. And all other patients in the middle have to be discussed in the um, setting of a heart team. So Sabine, how does this particular patient fit within these guidelines? When we look at the slide, uh, Nico, I would say this patient is uh, clearly on the right side. She is exactly 75 years, so in the borderline um, between Sav uh, Savra or Tavi. Uh, she's a, a low-risk patient um, in terms of uh, risk calculation, but also in terms of her clinical state. What we also take into account is her coronary disease, which also has to be treated. Um, if we do it surgically, we would have a, a bigger surgery. It's a combined surgery then. I uh, think um, the age uh, threshold simplificated um, our decision somehow because we can just say 75 years and older, just go for TAVI. And uh, it's a new way of thinking because if you think 10 years um, ago, we were um, discussing if somebody cannot undergo uh, surgery, we do TAVI. Now it's the other way around somehow. And if somebody cannot undergo TAVI, we do surgery. But this patient is a good TAVI candidate. She's 75 years old. And so um, according to these guidelines, she's a good TAVI candidate. Okay. Now, Sabine, I think if you just review the next several slides, can you tell us a little bit about the clinical factors and, and, uh, and the um, you know, procedural factors and also the cardiac conditions that might influence you with respect to this patient? Yes, I think everybody knows this um, table from the guidelines um, helping us uh, uh, for the decision. When we look at this table, this patient is really in between. She is um, on the lo lower surgical risk side. She is on the older age side and so on. There is um, nothing um, against TAVI. Um, this part of the table, um, we, we know the patient is a good femoral candidate, so... This is more on the TAVI side. She has a small anatomy with the risk of patient prosthesis mismatch, which, which also would favor TAVI. And the last part of the table uh, summarizes if there is um, any clear indication for combined surgery, which this patient has not because she has only one vessel disease, um, we should uh, favor SABR. So um, clearly, according to the guidelines, we can uh, go for TAVI in this patient. Very good. Okay, so in fact, we have a, a question from um, our listeners, from Ahmed uh, Zaran. Uh, good afternoon to you. Um, he asks, um, who does the patient selection and who follows the patient after TAVI? Is it the operator um, or is it some other member of the team? Um, or maybe it's geographical uh, differences, uh, depending on which hospital you, you're at and, uh, you know, for historical reasons. So maybe, Sabine, in your center, um, who does the patient selection and who does the follow-up afterwards? Um, indeed, we, we have a, a real hard team and we uh, do everything together. So we discuss all the findings of the patient's in our heart team conference or with individual uh, visits of the patient. And uh, we do the procedure together and the follow-up is also organized um, from both clinics together, from the cardiological so, and surgical unit. So Sabine, uh, there's uh, another um, listener, uh, Kamel Ali Haider, 
uh, who asks, uh, you know, the patient is in fact 75 years old uh, and the STS score is below 4%. Um, so it's a challenging question. Uh, you know, is this a, a real uh, clear cut TAVI case or do you think maybe in another center uh, this might ha patient have undergone surgical aortic valve replacement as well? So I have no doubt this patient can undergo surgery. She also would have a good result with surgery. What we also, what we always have if we do surgery, we invest a little more surgical risk. But um, on the long term, we, we need more data to um, um, to evaluate uh, which uh, how patients will, will do better. We, we have some data from Partner 2A, from Observant, from Gary Registry, demonstrating that at five years, maybe things may change. But we know the procedural risk, 30-day mortality, um, there is an advantage for, for the less invasive strategies. And um, so I would say from a technical standpoint, this patient can also undergo surgery. From the new guidelines we have, this is a patient for TAVI. And there is nothing against TAVI. In, in this patient um, um, history. Very good. Okay. So now if we can go back to the slides, uh, Jerome, you know, we, we have a, a relatively young patient, 75 years old. Um, you know, there's a number of, uh, I think, factors we need to think about when we, when we think about the lifetime management of patients with aortic stenosis. So maybe if you can um, you know, give us a little uh, idea of what are some of the factors we think about uh, in terms of lifetime management. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, this this is an important issue, of course, because now that we're going to uh, lower age uh, limits, um, there will be issues coming up like the valve durability, for example. Uh, we have longer term outcomes, but we still don't have super long term outcomes. So we don't know exactly, but the valve durability is going to be an important issue. Um, what we see for the moment is, of course, very safe procedures. Then you come to the discussion, what about valve replacement after TAVI? Because these patients will have the time to develop maybe restenosis. So you could think about transcatheter aortic valve in a transcatheter aortic valve, so TAVI and TAVI, if you like. That is happening already in some uh, cases. So we can also do surgical explant and surgical aortic valve replacement. So these are the options that we are going to be uh, faced with. That's what we're going to see because patients getting older, we're going down to lower age treatment. So we will have to start thinking about these things. It is already happening. Valve replacement after surgical aortic valve replacement. So transcatheter aortic valve in surgical aortic valve, TAVI and SAVR, if you like, or a surgical SAVR explant. These are also questions that are coming to the table and forming possibilities. So either you start with a TAVI and you put another TAVI, or you start with a TAVI and you switch to surgical, or you started with a surgical and then you do a TAVI in the surgical, or you do an explant. So these are the possibilities that we have. We will see how these things go, but for the moment, the management, as I just indicated, is the ones that has happened. So then we talk about commissure alignment during TAVI. That's an important issue. Another issue is going to be the management of coronary artery disease, how we're going to manage coronary arteries in these patients. And what relates directly to that is coronary access after TAVI. And that is a really important issue. We have already, uh, you and me, in this large overviews that we wrote in the European Heart Journal many years ago, we've already touched upon that issue. Because if you put the valve too close to the coronaries, then you're going to have access problems. So these are the issues if we talk about lifetime management of patients with aortic stenosis. We're all going to get confronted with that. And we will have to deal with that. These are, I think, the most important ones that we can think of at the moment. Okay, thanks, Jerome. Uh, so, Sabine, you know, the first thing on that slide is valve durability. Um, you know, when you think about your patients um, undergoing TAVI, um, you know, is there um, a cutoff uh, with respect to age when you start thinking, I'm not going to put a transcatheter aortic valve because the patient is too young uh, and I'm afraid that valve durability is going to be an issue? Um, the guidelines, of course, state 75, but from your own experience, from your own uh, ideas, uh, when do you start telling yourself, maybe this is just a little bit too young right now because I'm still not sure about valve durability? 
That's a tough question because um, if we decide to do a transcatheter uh, procedure in a younger patient, there are um, important reasons for that. Postlane or other patients who cannot undergo surgery. So um, there we don't really can start with a durability question. I, I think we, we cannot make an age threshold. I um, think we, we all expect transcatheter heart valves will have uh, equal durability to biological valves. We have some data. Can we have the slide from the Notion trial? Now, these are uh, quite long-term data, up to eight years, demonstrating equal durability in low-risk patients in a randomized trial up to eight years and uh, no difference in uh, durability. So if we um, um, have this in mind, we... we would not expect um, any um, disadvantage if we go uh, go for a TAVI procedure. Jerome, what do you think yeah. about, uh, if we just go back to the slide, uh, Sabine? Yes. I just want to get Jerome's uh, ideas. But, you know, what are your thoughts about this slide, uh, Jerome? Uh, there's, uh, you know, maybe sample size considerations here. There's uh, maybe methodology of how to uh, evaluate these valves on echo. Um, you know, what are some of your thoughts when, when looking at this slide? Well, yeah, we, we discussed it previously already a little bit. And uh, I think the first one that you see is the, the study starts with a relatively uh, smaller sample size and it ends at eight years with relatively small sample size, right? So based on these numbers, this looks very favorable. And probably there is a high likelihood that it's going to look like this. But I think we need more solid data. We need to have more information in larger, longer-term follow-up, larger samples, longer-term follow-up. That is important. And, um, and then we come to this whole question, like, how do we follow up these patients? We had a couple of years ago, these hypes about that CTs were done in all these patients. And then we started to see on the CT all this valve thrombosis. Um, but we published quite early already that all these valve thrombosis did usually not translate into increased gradients. So one thing that we're learning here also in the follow-up is what is important to look at. So I think sequential CTs is certainly not the way to go because a CT comes with significant radiation. And I think a CT, as we'll discuss probably a little bit later, is probably mostly indicated if you have any suspicion about something wrong. Um, but I think what we should do is that we have routine echoes. The way we do it is we do immediately after, 30 days after, then six months, then 12 months, then yearly. Uh, everybody has his own algorithm, but uh, this is how we do it. And what do you check? Well, we do very simple checks. We look at uh, the aortic valve area, the gradients, LV function, very important in this follow-up. Um, and that's it mostly. Okay. So Sabine, you know, one of the things that uh, we're starting to, uh, you know, to think about is, okay, uh, you know, we have these patients uh, who are undergoing transcatheter aortic valve uh, implantation uh, and the valve fails. So they get some failure and they need their valve to be changed. Uh, the two options are, as we said, either a surgical explant or a redo uh, TAV and TAV. Um, yeah, what are your what are your thoughts about surgical explantation of TAVR valves? First of all, there are um, some concerns about uh, the procedure of surgical explant because um, we know from this um, explant registry data quite high mortality of thirteen percent at thirty days. Um, and that um, there was quite uh, some rate of uh, root replacement even because of uh, root injury during the procedure. Um, there are several things about uh, this uh, registry. First of all, half of the patient were urgent explants. That uh, tells me that this was not only um, degenerated valves. There were endocarditis cases or some other um, emergent um, uh, findings. So this um, might not reflect the population we are just now talking about. So a patient who receives a valve which degenerates and then gets um, elective um, or planned uh, redo procedure. So And these patients, because um, the um, implantation uh, dates were from 2009 on, 
These were really high-risk patients when they got the implantation, their first TAVI implantation. When we think about our patient now today, 75 years, low risk, um, she will be in a much better uh, shape, I think, also when her valve is degenerated in 10 years or 15 years. Um, and the next thing is, I think there is still some um, room um, or need for education of surgeons. Maybe um, some of the surgeons who did these explantations um, were not well educated about uh, the stent shapes of the different uh, types of transcatheter heart valves, because I think that uh, plays a major role if you explant um, such a prosthesis, if you have a lot of knowledge about how the stent looks like, where is it anchored, and um, maybe you can use cold water to, to make the um, uh, nitinol stents more flexible for the explantation. And I think there are a lot of factors um, which can facilitate the explantation and um, may improve the results. Sabine, so, you know, I, I see two uh, 13 uh, percents in this slide. I see 13 percent of patients who required an aortic root replacement. And I see 13% of patients who died at 30 days. Mm -hmm. uh, in your experience, uh, do you think the root replacement is related uh, to the urgency or electiveness of the procedure? Uh, do you think it's, again, uh, relates to, um, as you said, education uh, of the surgeons? Um, or... Uh, you know, from your experience, uh, yeah, maybe one out of six, one out of 10 patients that I explant a TAVI valve, I'm going to have to do a uh, root replacement. And I, I'm, I'm compounding the question here. Is it probably more so with self-expanding long frames than with short frames? This root replacement. So what, what do you, yeah, what do you think? I, I don't think it is related to if it is urgent or elective uh, surgery. And it's not so much related to the, um, to the indication for the replacement. It's uh, more related to how, how um, strong the adhesions are, where the valve is um, at that point. Maybe it's more the length, how long the valve is already inside. And... Uh, yeah, no, there, I, I think it is, um, the numbers are much too small to make uh, any clear um, um, relations um, for the reasons why there were so uh, some root replacements. I think education is one factor, because if you don't know how the valve is anchored, you might injure uh, the anapotomy more likely, as if you are, have a clear idea of what you have to cut out and where you have to cut out uh, the valve. Okay. Okay. So Sabine, uh, I think the next slide gives us a picture um, of an explant or um, someone removing an explant. Yeah, uh, a TAVI. Um, so, you know, what what are some of the uh, tips and tricks that you do when you remove um, a self-expanding prosthesis uh, from uh, from a patient? Yeah. First of all, you have to do your otic. Um incision high enough um, not to uh, get uh, into interference with the valve stand. Then um, cold water is a, a good uh, tip to, to make the valve more flexible. And I uh, would always do just blunt excision, so not with a knife or with the scissors, just blunt excision. And usually um, you can excise the valve like that. Um, okay. you, you have to know there is some uh, additional tissue always. You see that on, on the distal end of the stent frame. But uh, this can be removed quite easily. This uh, should not have uh, tight adhesions. Um, the most tight adhesions are at the area of the, um, of the anchoring, so at the annular area. So, so Sabine, uh, in, in your practice, uh, suppose the 75-year-old lady... Uh, comes back three years later with a degenerated valve electively, um, which way will you go? Will you go for a TAV and TAV, uh, or will you go for a uh, surgical explant and surgical aortic valve? It, um, it will be an individual decision, uh, depending on what is the mechanism of the failure and what is the problem. So if um, she would have a 
severe or more severe paraviolar leakage, I think I would be more on the on the side to to do surgery now, um, if the patient is still low risk or intermediate risk and good for surgery. Um, if she just has a degenerated valve, which is um, which I would not expect after three years, but as, of course everything is possible, um, I would evaluate her for for tough and tough. And and would you go for a uh, balloon or self-expanding valve at that time? So I think um, most people would would mix it. So if the first implantation is a self-expandable, the next implantation might be a short valve to um, um, save the coronary reaccess, and the other way around also for better yeah, hemodynamics. And, then, right? And there's the whole question about whether or not we perform a basilica in order to uh, improve the coronary flow and coronary access. Okay, so uh, we, we, we spoke about, um, you know, the whole durability and uh, redo uh, aortic valve. Um, you know, the uh, other whole uh, um, idea behind the lifetime management of patients with um, aortic stenosis and undergoing TAVR is this whole idea of coronary access. And so if we go to the next slide, Sabine. You know, we can see on the left-hand side, uh, this is a uh, non-selective uh, injection of the coronary arteries uh, within an optimal uh, view of the left main. And so, um, you know, in some of these cases, we could uh, aim uh, and use the CT scan to find the optimal view of the left main because they've had a CT scan in the past. Uh, so you can use that in certain cases when you have the time. Um, and then, of course, there's a bunch of tips and tricks um, on how to engage the coronaries. On the right-hand side, you can see that a uh, guideliner or mother and child technique was used uh, across a coaxial strut um, in order to engage with the coronaries. But again, this is going to be a whole uh, important uh, story um, in the lifetime management of patients with um, aortic stenosis. Um, now, um, let's go back to the patient, uh, Jerome. Um, you know, what are some of the, uh, so this 75-year-old patient has to undergo a number of uh, imaging tests before uh, the procedure. What are some of the, the imaging tests that are mandatory before a transfemoral TAVI procedure? Well, I think what we see is that almost everything nowadays is possible with imaging. But at the same time, we should be realistically uh, using these imaging techniques to answer the questions that we have. And that's all that you need. So we got all this PET-CT, CT, MR, et cetera, et cetera. And you can see many more variations, but I think we should remain always practical. So I would say we have got four questions, valve characteristics, LV function, concomitant valve disease, and coronary arteries. We spoke a lot about this whole route, et cetera. If we speak about purely the valve, uh, there are a couple of questions that are important. Most important is, are we dealing with tricuspid or bicuspid valves? What is the gradient? What is the valve area? Um, how much calcium load is there? So I think echocardiography answers most of our questions. However, the whole question around bicuspid valves is always difficult. And for that, we best have a CT scan. One issue that I've started thinking about is that we are, whatever imaging technique we use, we will never be able to uh, differentiate a true bicuspid at an older age patient from a degenerative tricuspid. You know what that looks like, right? If you see them on CT, they look almost the same. So echoes is the main thing for um, the tricuspid versus bicuspid. We need a CT. If it becomes difficult, gradient and aortic valve area comes from the echo and the calcium load comes from the CT. Let's take the next parameter then that we discussed about. So it's LV function. LV function, we traditionally express as ejection fraction, which works perfectly fine as long as you don't have things like severe mitral regurgitation. Then your ejection fraction is a little bit um, overestimated. 
How do we measure ejection fraction? Also very simple, echocardiography. Nowadays, we use three-dimensional echocardiography, but I think for routine assessment, two-dimensional echocardiography is just perfect, just fine. Um, but then we have started to realize that it's not just the ejection fraction, but it's also what is happening in that uh, tissue, so to say, of the ventricle. And we've seen that left ventricular fibrosis uh, in patients with aortic stenosis starts to occur quite early. So for academic reasons for the moment, we would be interested in the amount of LV fibrosis and it can be diffuse fibrosis, which we cannot see with the CMR, but we measure with T1 mapping. Um, and if we want to see these big scars, then we use uh, delayed contrast enhancement. So LV function, I say ejection fraction is the mainstay. We use an echocardiogram. And if we want to learn more about this ventricular uh, compositions, fibrosis, we do a CMR. Then we come to concomitant valve disease. So the most important for us is mitral regurgitation. And for that, basically, we do echocardiography. One question that is always very difficult is if you see a ventricular function that's reasonably OK, you have a severe aortic stenosis, you have a mitral regurgitation, 2, 2 plus, maybe a little bit more. Is that going to disappear after your TAVI or not? That's a question that nobody for the moment can answer. That's just um, to be seen. But how do you measure? It's just simple echocardiography. And then comes the coronary arteries. And for the coronary arteries, we use CT scan. So we see how much atherosclerosis there is. One should also realize that uh, what a CT scan sees is just the calcium, the calcium load in the coronary arteries. And sometimes the resolution is not ideal. It's not infrequent that we like to have an invasive angiogram. So I've given you, in a nutshell, the characteristics of um, the different components, valve, ventricle, uh, concomitant valve, and coronary arteries. And I've given you, in a nutshell, what imaging you can use. I think there's a lot on the market for imaging, but the mainstay for us is echocardiography. But what we start to use more and more is CT scan. Thanks, Jerome. Now, you know, Sabine, in, in our practice right now, um, you know, we're always questioning the utility of the coronary angiogram uh, for patients undergoing TAVI, especially uh, when they're elderly and do not have angina. There is this uh, growing practice that we don't necessarily need to treat uh, you know, all of the coronary disease. And of course, you know, we like to treat the left mains, the proximal LADs or the proximal RCAs. But as Jerome can tell us, uh, these lesions can be easily identified on, on a good quality or a decent CT scan. And so, you know, we're, we've told ourselves without, you know, just trying to use some logic and common sense that patients above 85 who are asymptomatic um, and don't have uh, any, um, you know, inklings of coronary disease, we do not perform a coronary angiogram. We look at the CT scan for the proximal lesions and leave the rest for the future. Are, are you performing a coronary angiogram in every patient? Um, and if so, uh, why? Um, and yeah, do you think you will ever move to a, a time when coronary angiograms are no longer going to be necessary? Okay, interesting question. It seems as uh, if we are still quite conservative because we do coronary angiogram in all patients in, in preparation of a aortic valve procedure. Um, and uh, we would also treat uh, significant lesions also in patients above 85. When we come back to, to our 70 years old low risk patient now, she had a proximal LAD lesion, and um, this was, of course, treated in advance to the TAVI procedure. Yeah, I, I, th I think we would treat the proximal LAD lesion in a 75 year old patient as well, um, especially if it's FFR positive uh, in the setting of aortic stenosis. Um, you know, but, um, you know, there's, there has been some randomized clinical data to tell us that. Uh, whether or not you revascularize uh, certain patients um, before TAVI or not, it really doesn't make a difference in, in long-term clinical outcomes up to one year at least. So, um, you know, I, I, the, the, the whole concept of treating coronary disease, and, and please, Sabine, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, in the setting of surgery, uh, perhaps is the idea of getting patients off pump. 
safely um, and making sure they have a good coronary uh, flow reserve. Um, but maybe this is not the case for TAVI, um, and we do not need to revascularize every single vessel that has a significant lesion. Yes, and another reason why we uh, try to do complete revascularization during surgery is also when we think of uh, potential redo in the future, which is much more complex if you do it as a redo surgery. And um, also for the TAVI uh, patients, if you have to do a coronary reaccess with the TAVI in place, it might be more complex. So we are, I think it, this is one reason to be more liberal to, to treat the coronary lesions in advanced yeah. TAVI. And Jerome, can you uh, provide any insights into the use of uh, the CT scan, the pre-procedural CT scan? You think we're, we, we've been missing the boat here or, or missing an opportunity? To diagnose coronary no, I, 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 uh, yeah, I was just raising my hands con concerning that point uh, because, um, of course, we with the CT scans we we start to see much more atherosclerosis than than we saw before on the angiogram. It's it's much, and you get information on the calcium, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I think what is becoming more relevant one is that we can actually measure from the CT scan non-invasively the CT FFR. And I think that's a big step forward now that we can do that. Of course, following your discussion that we were just having, it's not necessarily that you need to treat all these patients. But if you see your CT scan, when you start just working with CT scans, it looks quite that you say, wow, there is significant disease here. But often when you measure the FFR, we started doing that invasively. And then later on, we start to work with the uh, non-invasive FFR. Then you see that quite often it looks not so good on the CT anatomy, but the functional consequences are minimal. There is not much uh, to be seen on the FFR. So I think that's going to be an important step forward if we can routinely do that in the CT. Uh, and then to come to your final point is that, yeah, when when is it needed in that patient? That's a very complex one, right? Because we don't have any form of data that we can say, well, we left this alone and look what happened now, or we left this alone and it, it worked out perfectly fine. That's something there where we certainly have to find out more, but it's it's going to be difficult actually to prove that. You will need huge sample sizes and then long-term outcomes to say anything about it. And then even how do you link an event that's going to come from a coronary after you've done the TAVI? That's, that's going to be quite complex. So I think it's good to have the anatomy completely uh, visualized. It's even better to have the functional consequences of this anatomy visualized. And then it comes at the moment down to hard team decision. Okay. Okay. So uh, interesting discussions, of course. Um, okay, so look, we, we've spoken about patient selection. We've spoken about uh, all the factors, the clinical factors, the anatomical factors, the procedural factors, the concomitant cardiac conditions, and we've also uh, talked about some of the lifetime considerations um, when selecting a particular treatment modality. Um, Sabine, let's move over to the uh, procedure now and talk about what are some of the best practices uh, that we should keep in mind um, when treating um, patients undergoing transfemoral TAVI. Okay, so we already mentioned it. Our patient was um, uh, had the heart team decision for transcatheterotic valve replacement, and she had treated her coronary lesion in advance, which was FFR positive, and she also had um, angina as a symptomatic. So I think this was a clear indication for coronary treatment. And for the TAVI procedure, I would like to focus on, on three aspects. One is the access, uh, second is uh, coronary reaccess, and the third is high implantation. So for the access, we um, prefer now, uh, during the last one or two years, the ultrasound guided puncture, because we think it is very um, um, exact and uh, you don't have um, 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 of puncture failures and uh, you need less radiation and so we think this is uh, the best way to go and uh, we also increasingly use now the radial artery as a second arterial access um, although we didn't have re evaluated our own data there is some literature that um, vascular complications or, um, uh, can be reduced with this 
So this um, is our best practice for the transfemoral tavi. And for the coronary reaccess with uh, with a self-expandable valve, we um, can um, assure uh, the correct commissural alignment when we uh, look at the head marker, which has to be at the outer curve, as you see in the left picture, um, during advancement of the crimped valve. And uh, when it comes towards the annulus, you have to see the uh, head marker in, uh, in a central position in the overlap. Um, position and um, after valve deployment you see the c-tap at the outer curve which is pointing to a commissure so um, with this um, um, a, a, um, radiation markers or fluoroscopic markers you can assure that you have a correct commissure alignment of uh, the self-expandable valve and um, our and especially in this patient who has coronary heart disease and um, where we uh, and she might uh, have coronary re or need for coronary reaccess in the future. And the final aspect is um, we want to achieve a high implantation of the valve, first of all, to avoid conduction disturbance by the radial forces of the valve and um, also to reduce paravalvular leakages because we know um, the valve function is best if we have a very high implantation. And um, the only thing we changed is somehow how we look at the valve, but it changed a lot because we um, have no uh, shortage in the LVOT like that and we can um, 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 implant the valve much more exactly on the implantation head. On the left, you see uh, where we start with our uh, marker at the mid pigtail um, level, which is much higher than we started um, um, in the past. And uh, you see in the middle picture how high this valve then uh, comes into its position. And uh, on the right, you see the final implantation head, which is uh, quite high and um, with, with just a very few... Um, very small um, or a trivial paravalvular leakage in this patient. So we were very, very happy with this result. And uh, yeah, these are our best practices, I would say, for implantation of a self-expandable heart valve. Yeah, you know, Sabine, I, I um, you know, the, the, another interesting point about the cusp overlap technique, um, you know, we, we end up implanting, of course, in the areo caudal view. Um, in the vast majority of patients, probably in 85 Correctly. to 90 percent. And uh, we're, you know, we're overlapping the right and the left cusp, but we're isolating the non-coronary cusp to the left of the screen. And, um, you know, the, the whole cusp overlap technique, of course, originated uh, from the double S curve, if you recall. And the whole concept behind the double S curve was, um, can we get the aortic annulus in plane and can we get the delivery catheter in plane in one single view? And so we, you know, we used to get the S curve of the annulus and the S curve of the delivery catheter. Their intersection point on the grid would be where they're both in plane. So we would mitigate parallax or foreshortening of the anatomy and the delivery catheter. Now, when I went in Proctor uh, Hemalgada with a double S curve in 2015, 16, uh, Hemal said, he came back to me a few weeks later. He says, look, he says, I, I don't have all the software and, uh, you know, you have to do a lot of intra-procedural uh, measurements. He says, I think what you're doing all the time is just isolating the non-coronary cusp. And so we went back and compared the double S curve to the cusp overlap technique we published in Jack Interventions not too long ago. And the correlation was over 95%. It was amazing that you know, all of this time doing the double S intended to get the delivery catheter in plane and the annulus in plane was in fact isolating the non-coronary cusp. And so uh, I think the important, uh, the, the important idea here, if you look on your picture on the far left, your first picture on the far left, your annulus is in plane and your radio pick markers in plane. And that's, uh, I think, the, uh, one of the key messages is that the cusp overlap technique puts both the anatomy and the delivery catheter both in plane so you can get proper height uh, appreciations on fluoroscopy. Um, 
uh, uh, Sabine, just a question on, um, you know, at the end, you have a, a really nice result here. You have very mild um, aortic regurgitation. How do you deal with mild aortic regurgitation in uh, younger patients? Are you very aggressive with post dilatation nowadays, um, or do you leave it alone? No, depending on the age of the patient, in fact, the younger the patient, we are more aggressive in post dilatation. So we would not leave a, a mild um, regurgitation. If there is any. Just uh, a point, uh, um, is, is this quantification of this aortic regurgitation, this paravalvular leaks is always difficult. Huh? What, how do you do that, Nico, in the practice? How do you quantify it? Just eyeballing or how do you take that? That's yeah, never look, been uh, really solved. Yeah, you're right, Jerome. I, I, you know, in, in clinical practice, at least, we, we use the angiogram, uh, you know, to make intraprocedural decisions. Um, you know, I think we got a good idea whether it's uh, trivial uh, or mild. Uh, you know, it's always sometimes difficult to understand maybe what's a good mild versus a moderate. Um, but, uh, you know, we, 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 we tend to do what Sabine says. Um, you know, in younger patients, we tend to be more aggressive with the post dilatation. And, you know, in many cases, it, it does improve uh, the uh, residual paravalvular leak. Um, so, uh, you know, on the topic of, uh, of imaging, Jerome, um, you know, this patient now is going to, uh, uh, you know, stay in hospital for a day or two and uh, is going to require some follow-up for valve function. Um, so, you know, what do you suggest in terms of uh, imaging this patient uh, long-term? Do we need, uh, you know, a six-month echo, 12-month echo? Do we need serial CT scans in patients? What's the, what's the chest, uh, checklist like? Yeah, we discussed a little bit before already. Eh? So I think a follow-up CT is something that, that we hardly ever do. So I said to you, uh, there was this, this whole discussion about valve thrombosis recently. And I must say, if you look at the clinical arena now, that has more or less disappeared, right? We, we're not talking much about that anymore. So we're not doing routine CT follow-up. We do a quick echo after. And uh, we do then six. We, and initially, we did quickly after one month, six months, one year. And uh, we have gradually shifted towards quick follow-up, then six months, then one year, and then yearly. I think that there is nothing much more. And, of course, if, if symptoms occur. But otherwise, not too much follow-up and not too complex either. Okay, thanks, Jerome. You know, I just, uh, Sabine, I want to go back uh, to um, uh, just a question we have from one of the uh, listeners from Juan Del Portillo. Um, you know, he, he talks about, uh, you know, you did commissural alignment uh, in your procedure, uh, but there's this whole idea of coronary alignment uh, depending on how eccentric the coronary arteries are from the commissures. Uh, you know, we might get misalignment despite getting, we might get coronary misalignment despite getting good commissural alignment. Um, and so uh, is this something that you, that you look out for um, on your CT scans or, or perhaps it's a little bit too early to understand the implications? So we know that our commissural alignment will not be too exact. So I think um, from... Uh, for today, it is um, impossible to, to make this so exact and to take into account if uh, there are some degrees of um, um, more left or right um, towards the commissure um, of the coronary takeoff. And uh, usually in most patients, um, there is not so much variation, except for patients with a bicuspid valve that we more often see um, 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 strange coronary takeoffs. So no, we don't take this into account um, when we plan our procedure. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, you know Juan Portillo makes a makes a good point. Maybe in the in the future, when we're able to better align our valves, maybe with some um, you know device iterations that allow intraannular rotation, um, perhaps we'll be able to align the nadirs of the bioprosthetic leaflets uh, with the coronary ostia. 
um, in order to get perfect uh, coronary alignment with the nadir of the bioprosthetic leaflets as opposed to aiming for the commissures. Uh, Sabine, we, we have uh, uh, a few minutes left uh, to talk about um, you know, the antiplatelet, anticoagulant strategy uh, when uh, treating patients after TAVI. Um, you know, can you tell us what your intentions are uh, with antiplatelet, anticoagulants in this particular patient? Uh, and maybe tell us a little bit of, of what the guidelines have to say about that. Of course, we want to uh, prevent um, thromboembolic events. That's why we do antithrombotic um, treatment. Um, the guidelines, the new guidelines now say we should do single antiplatelet or single anticoagulation in patients with an indication for that. And that's exactly how we do it after those randomized trials who came up last uh, the last two years. Yes, can we show and, the slide? Uh, for, this, for this particular patient, um, I'm sorry, um, I think the, yeah, you can see it here on, on the right bottom, single antiplatelet for patients who don't have uh, indication for oral articulation, coagulation. And oral anticoagulation for three months, and also and the single antiplatelet um, lifelong. I would just like to add that in this patient we had a PCI in advance, so this patient of course has double antiplatelet um, for six months, and then single antiplatelet lifelong. Okay, and uh, Sabine, uh, patients who come in with uh, atrial fibrillation, for instance. Um, you know, how, how, how would you treat them? Would you just keep them on the oral anticoagulant or would you also bridge them with a bit of Plavix uh, for a few months? No, if they don't have a, a new stent implantation, we would c uh, continue the drug they uh, had um, before the TAVI, so um, Bufferin mm -hmm. or uh, NORC. Okay, very good, very good. Okay, so, um, you know, we... Uh, so, you know, we went from a, uh, a discussion uh, using a 75-year-old female patient who uh, uh, was, uh, we would say, you know, uh, low to intermediate risk for surgery um, and had proximal LAD disease. Uh, the patient uh, underwent a uh, PCI of the LAD followed by a transcatheter aortic valve. Uh, we spoke about uh, a number of things. Uh, Jerome, um, do you want to maybe tell us a little bit uh, about some take-home messages um, that we uh, should consider uh, after this uh, nearly one hour of discussion? Yeah, yeah, one hour almost. Um, I think the uh, take-home messages are, are basically very straightforward. We have now new ESC, EACTS guidelines. I think one thing to highlight there is ESC, EACTS guidelines. So that means right. what, we, what we see here is that um, surgery and cardiology work together. They do these things together. They evaluate these patients together and they work with the patients together. So that calls for heart team evaluation. And that is the fundament, I think, of this whole discussion or this whole session that we do. The heart team is crucial in this. So patients less than 75 years at low risk for SAVR, which is an STS score less than 4%, or unsuitable for transfemoral TAVI, they are being referred for surgical aortic valve replacement. The patients over 75 years or high risk for risk uh, or high risk for SAVR with an STS more than 8% and suitable for transfemoral TAVI, they go for TAVI. And all the other patients are discussed in the heart team. And the heart team, as I said, is key because that's where all the specialties come together. It's not only the surgeons and the um, transcatheter, the interventional cardiologist, but it's also the imaging people. It is anesthesiologists. It is heart failure doctors because a lot of these patients, not specifically this ones, but a lot of the patients being discussed in the heart team have left or right LV problems. So I think the heart team evaluation is key and that's something that we need to keep in mind. And um, the second one is the lifetime management that we spoke about. And we discussed issues such as valve durability, redo procedures, 
the management of coexistent coronary artery disease, where we have a lot of questions. Should we treat this? Should we not treat that? And then the coronary access after TAVI. I think these are the issues that we have discussed here today. And um, I learned a lot. I think it's always good to have these discussions and to rethink what are we doing. But these are the take home messages that I think are important. Thanks very much. Thank you, Jerome. Sabine, do you want to make any uh, closing remarks perhaps as well? No, I can um, only underline what Jerome has said about the heart team discussions because I also think they are so important and all patients should be discussed in the heart team, also the clear cases. And uh, that's how we also do it in Bad Oeynhausen. And um, I, I appreciated this session in a true heart team with an imager and an interventional cardiologist and hope to see you soon. Okay, so again, uh, we'd like to thank our listeners uh, and everyone who participated uh, with us here today. Um, again, um, the uh, the title of the of this session was "How Should the Heart Teams Adapt to Recently Updated Valvular Heart Disease Guidelines?" Uh, we just like to uh, uh, make sure that uh, people know that this is the first in a number of PCR webinars uh, on the treatment of patients with aortic stenosis. Um, and there will be additional PCR webinars uh, upcoming in February, um, and we highly suggest that you attend those as well. Um, thank you, uh, Jerome. Uh, thank you, Sabine. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to see each other in person uh, again very soon. Um, and uh, a big happy new year to all of you uh, out there.